Thought I'd take this outside, it's a lovely day. A few weeks ago, I did a little review about mRNA vaccines after scaring in the internet and reading way too many papers on it. And it looks like I got most of it right. But now we have an actual expert, very excited, an actual expert on this stuff to answer all of those other questions that came up. Let's roll the videotape. Hi, I'm Brianne Barker. I am an associate professor of biology at Drew University um, and co-host of podcasts This Week in Virology and Immune. You're all wondering how I found Brianne because she's not an MD, she's not an emergency physician, she's a biologist. So there's this great program, I've talked about it on our program a lot, uh, This Week in Virology. Don't think you need to be a virologist to understand what they talk about on this show. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, they talk about the viruses, particularly COVID, they talk about the vaccines and they talk with clinicians as well. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening, I'm like, I've got to get Brianne on the show to talk about mRNA vaccines um, because we're all interested in these now and vaccines in general. So Brianne, can you, I've got some very specific questions about mRNA vaccines that some of the clinicians have asked that I've asked. Um, so can you first tell me if I'm wrong, the way this works for the Pfizer and for the Moderna vaccine is you take this strip of mRNA that encodes for the spike protein, mm -hmm. you put it, put it in some nanolipid thing Yep. And then you inject a whole bunch of that into a person. Exactly. And that, that lipid layer sort of fuses with the cell and somehow the mRNA gets into the cell and I start making spike protein and then I get an immune response to the spike protein that I've created. Basically, yes. That is basically how it works. So the big question that I had and a number of us had is, how does that turn off? When does that stop? Or do I make spike protein for the rest of my life? So you don't make spike protein for the rest of your life. Um, so this actually sort of relates to the question of which cells are making the spike protein. Um, and there are kind of three options um, of cells that are going to make the spike protein. This is an intramuscular injection. And so some of the cells that are going to make spike protein will be myocytes that get transfected with the mRNA. Mm -hmm. um, some will be uh, local dendritic cells. So some local dendritic cells will get that mRNA and then move to the lymph node. And in either case, um, we're going to see some priming of CD8 T cells, um, killer T cells. Um, mm -hmm. So they will start to make a good immune response. Um, the first time that a CD8 T cell sees its protein antigen on the surface of a cell, that activates the T cell. The second time the T cell sees its antigen, it kills the cell. You're going to see um, those cells that are producing spike eventually get killed and be cleared by the very immune response that they have induced. Okay, so it's not like it's you're allowed to make uh, one million copies of this and then you it gets magically turned off. No, it, there isn't. Um, one of the uh, students in my PhD lab, one of my fellow students, was doing some similar experiments um, with DNA-based vaccines. And he showed a really nice relationship with the strength of the immune response and how quickly the um, vaccine was cleared. Okay, so that makes me feel better that I'm not gonna be making spike protein no. for the rest of my life. That's gonna produce these tangles and make me demented. I had all of these no. things, or turn me not into a all. vampire, like nope. a movie. Okay, so that's great. Why uh, is the Pfizer vaccine required to be at minus 70 degrees Celsius and the Moderna vaccine at about, I think, minus seven degrees, which is like a normal freezer? Right. So um, the Moderna is it at minus 20, which is normal freezer. Um, mm -hmm. The Pfizer is at minus 70. And there are sort of two answers to that. I'm not going to say that either of them is going to be terribly fulfilling for you. Um, okay. To be honest with you, one of them is that Moderna did a lot more testing in terms of looking at the stability of their vaccine and actually showed its stability um, at the low, the uh, higher temperatures. Um, and Pfizer didn't do that. Um, and so it's entirely possible that Pfizer's could be stable at the same temperatures as Moderna's, um, but they haven't done the quality control work um, in the speed of getting this vaccine up and running. The other issue that uh, it makes this a little bit tricky, has to do with that lipid nanoparticle that the mRNA is with. Um, in both cases, the lipid that they are using is proprietary. Um, so one could imagine that the specifics of the lipid formulation might impact the storage considerations. And since we don't know the details of those lipids, 
um, it's hard to say whether that's part of the issue. Another question I have then is, um, one of them, I can't remember which way it goes, uh, is zero time zero and three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is time zero and four weeks. Uh, why? Um, why three versus four? Yeah. Um, I think that's based on their past experience with similar types of vaccines and the protocol that they came up with. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that the three weeks and the four weeks have massive biological significance or difference here. Mm -hmm. um, if it were me, I probably would have picked four weeks, but I don't think there's a huge difference. One of the things we found with the, uh, who made this one, the Oxford vaccine, mm -hmm. is that that is, a, tell me if I'm from wrong, it's the same sort of mRNA spike protein genome thing that's been put into a monkey virus. Mm -hmm. And then you inject that in, then you get your immune response in it and so it's the spike protein. And by chance or by screw up, they gave a half dose and then a full dose instead of full dose, full dose in a subset, I think in Brazil and found that they got a better immune response. Why is that? So um, it was a little bit unclear with their story. Um, in the most recent evidence that we looked at in this week in virology, it's the British cohort where they had um, the group that I got the half dose and then the full dose. Um, part of it is actually related to something else that you've mentioned. So this is a monkey virus that they're using. Um, it's called chimpanzee adeno. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason why they're using that virus is that adenoviruses are known to be really good at delivering nucleic acid, but they have this problem that many people have already been infected with them. And your body makes a really strong immune response, which can destroy the vaccine before it has time to induce an anti-spike response. So they used a chimpanzee virus to get around this and to hope that people hadn't previously been infected with this virus. What we think happened is when they went high dose, high dose, the first administration led to such a strong adenovirus response that the second the second vaccine administration actually got blunted um, by the immune system trying to clear the adenovirus. There wasn't enough time to make a spike specific response to the second dose. Um, and that's been seen in some other types of adenovirus uh, studies. There are some other immunological um, hypotheses that people have been arguing about that could be going on here, but the pre exist or the immunity to the vector um, is the thing that most people think happened here. Okay, so again, I'll simplify it, dumb MD style. <laughs> so you've got some proteins and stuff on the outside of that monkey adenovirus that you got an immune response to. And then when you got the second dose, it took out that virus before it could insert any more mRNA. But, right, before you could actually make the mRNA response. My understanding is that um, you can give these vaccines over and over again when you do this uh, lipid nanoparticles because we don't actually get an immune response to the lipid nanoparticles. Is that correct? Exactly. We make a little bit of an inflammatory response to the mRNA and to the lipid, but we don't make an antibody or a T-cell response. And so you can give an mRNA vaccine again and get, again and again and again. Um, and if there was some new pathogen in the future, you could get an mRNA vaccine and be fine. Um, if you if there was some new pathogen in the future, you couldn't get the monkey adenovirus vac vaccine if you had previously received monkey adenovirus uh, COVID vaccines because you'd make such a strong response to the vector. What have you guys been doing in the lab that makes mRNA vaccines work now and you couldn't make them work in the past? Because I understand this is the first commercially available mRNA vaccines. You've been studying them, but they haven't so, actually been released yet. There have been um, a few different uh, clinical trials, mostly in phase one and phase two of mRNA-based vaccines before. Um, so before uh, the Moderna and Pfizer trials, there have been about 1,300 patients who had gotten mRNA vaccines starting in 2013. Um, they had largely been relatively successful, but I think a lot of this has to do with some modifications to the mRNA to make it more stable. Um, so that it's not immediately degraded um, when injected and some modifications to that lipid nanoparticle. So there are 1,300. Did those 1,300 people, tell me the truth, did they turn into vampires? Because mm -hmm. we're worried about safety. 
I have not heard of any of them turning into vampires. No. Um, some of it was a, there were some rabies vaccines trials, uh, CMV vaccine trials. Um, there's a whole range uh, from Moderna and from another company. All right. Another question, which you may not know the answer to, maybe there isn't an answer. So if I got the Moderna vaccine, mRNA on T0, and I got the Pfizer vaccine at T four weeks, would that work? Or do you have to use the same manufacturer both times? I don't know why this is important, but maybe they'll run out of one. And I'm like, well, I'll just take this other one. So actually, it's a really important question. And we don't know the answer to it yet. They, they are not currently doing those experiments um, in patients to check on that. Um, but you could imagine when someone is actually going to get the vaccine, they may not, if they are not a This Week in Virology aficionado, they may not pay attention to which version of the vaccine they get. And they may come back three weeks later and the pharmacist may ask them, you know, do you need the Moderna second shot or the Pfizer second shot? And they may not know. And so this is entirely likely to happen um, to a number of people. Um, in my sort of immunologist uh, reading of this or as an immunologist, I think the Moderna and the Pfizer would probably be fine because they're using the same antigen. Um, and so it should work, um, but no one has officially done that experiment. That makes sense. So make sure you write down when you go get your vaccine, which one you exactly, got. That's yes. good. <laughs> right on the back of your head. Another question that a number of clinicians have asked because they've been infected with COVID. They're out there working, they've got infected. They presumably have uh, an antibody response, although we know from the convalescent plasma stuff, it's nowhere near as good as the response you're getting from these vaccines. Uh, is it safe for them to get vaccinated? Uh, or are they going to have this big secondary inflammatory response? From everything that um, has been published so far and shown so far, it would be safe for them to get the response. And the response that is coming from the vaccine is likely to be um, pretty superior to the response to natural infection. Um, with the vaccine, we're largely only using the spike protein um, and not any of the other proteins from the virus. Some of those other viral proteins seem to mess with the immune system. And so there's some pretty great uh, studies that have come out showing um, some defects that are happening in immune responses. Um, in natural infection, which might affect longevity. Um, the vaccine shouldn't have that problem. So that, you know, it's been very confusing to me. I thought that if I get infected with a virus that's actively replicating, I should get a great immune response to that and a vaccine could never be as good. But this seems to be the exact opposite for reasons that you're saying the virus is smart and doing some immune modulating to us. Exactly. So some of the MDs, if they remember um, thinking about some histology, they might have learned about germinal centers um, in lymph nodes um, once upon a time. Mm -hmm. It turns out that this virus messes up germinal centers. Um, and so there is a paper with some really beautiful images showing that in the draining lymph node and the spleen, um, COVID patients actually are not making germinal centers. Um, and so that would really negatively affect an antibody response and the longevity of that antibody response. This sneaky little virus, how dare I know. it. <laughs> In the papers I read, the, the immune response just to the spike protein is five to 20 fold the titers that you get with a natural infection. So uh, that would make sense. Yes. you're up for the vaccine. And let's say that uh, you are going to be going into a high risk area. So you're not gonna say no, you're like, I'm gonna get this vaccine. I need to have this vaccine. Which one would you get? I would be excited if I had that much choice. Um, I wonder whether with the distribution in terms of numbers of doses, whether say we might have different regions um, where one different vaccine is available. Uh, if it were up to me, uh, I saw some really great data um, in a paper that we discussed last week, comparing mRNA vaccines with protein vaccines, where the mRNA vaccines made much uh, better immune responses um, that had um, a lot more sort of immunological complexity, um, a lot more immunological flavor, shall we say, mm -hmm. um, that um, I was blown away by those data and was pretty excited about them. Um, and so that, you know, I was always pretty in the mRNA camp um, for sort of philosophical reasons, um, you know, no pre, no vector immunity. Um, and I think that mRNA vaccines are kind of a, a really great technology for the future, but that additional information about the immune responses, um, did get me pretty excited about the mRNA vaccines. And Pfizer versus Moderna? I guess Moderna, because it's easier, you know, to get here, um, in terms of, 
uh, shipping and those types of distribution requirements, but I'm not sure that I have a huge uh, preference. And safety, so Moderna had 30,000, uh, the Pfizer study had about 45-ish thousand. Are you happy with, well, it's hard, I know, because there hasn't been a published study, we'd really like to see the published study, but from the reports, are you happy that these uh, vaccines are safe? You know, you're going to get some fatigue, you're going to get some local reaction, which is normal. Of course. Um, from everything that I've seen, I am um, pretty happy that these vaccines are safe. Um, and that also includes some of the things I've seen in the preclinical studies and things like that. Um, these vaccines do look very safe. Um, if people are really interested in seeing um, some data about this, there is a researcher at um, the NIH um, named Barney Graham. Um, and he has someone in his lab, a woman named Kismikia Corbett. She's been giving a lot of presentations lately, um, and some of them are available online. And she has sort of the most data um, that's out there um, in a lot of cases. And so everything I've seen from them has indicated that these vaccines are very safe. Great. And we'll do some links in the show notes to those. I'll go find them. Um, one more question, perhaps, is there any chance that um, we're going to be able to get sort of the room temperature version of this vaccine, or is it uh, these type of vaccines are always going to need to be uh, frozen? Moderna has actually looked at refrigeration, um, and at the pharmacy, the vaccine should be able to um, stand for a few days at, uh, at refrigeration temperature. Um, and so I've seen uh, refrigeration um, for Moderna being out there. Um, without knowing the details of all of the um, the lipid nanoparticles, I can't totally say, but it could make sense. Um, some of the ones that are still to come have been tested at room temperature. Um, I believe um, one of the Johnson & Johnson administrations is being tested at room temperature and one of the Merck um, vaccines, they're both still to come. Um, so there are mm -hmm. some that are being talked about at room temp, they're just a little further behind. And their mRNA, the same? Same um, technology or are they protein-based? So or? Johnson & Johnson is uh, also a vector mm -hmm. and Merck, um, I think, is a protein, mm -hmm. um, but I am not sure I remember all of that correctly. What's the worst case effects of mRNA vaccines? Again, the safety profile looks good, but is there something... Uh, particularly for the clinicians out there, should we be looking for something? A million people, about 300 million people end up getting this. I'm working in the emergency department. Somebody comes in with a bizarre symptom. Is there any things that I need to look for? Is there any syndromes that can occur with these vaccines? I have not heard of any sim syndromes that have heard with, that have happened with the mRNA-based vaccines. Um, there are um, some discussions of some possible things with some of the adenovirus-based vaccines, but with the mRNAs, I have really not heard of anything. You know, I, I so I would be less worried about that with the mRNA based vaccines. Um, it's so you're it gonna seems be wiped that, out and have a fever. That's right. It seems from what you've said that it's it logically would make sense that you are less likely to have cross reactivity with your immune system, like transverse myelitis. Like exactly, some little virus might have a protein there that looks like your axons, and that'd be bad. But if you're just got this lipid thing, and mRNA that's very specific, it should have less side effects. Yes, so that, that is that is definitely the idea. And that's been the idea with um, all of the nucleic acid vaccines all along. Um, the trick has always been making them immunogenic, um, not in terms of sort of backing them off for safety. I think the one thing that people should be aware of is that you know these vaccines, um, say the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, are going for emergency use authorization um, in December based on, in the Moderna case, um, you know, 30,000 patients. Um, those patients are going to continue to be studied out to a two year mark um, before uh, full authorization is given. Um, and so this is not the end of examining what's happening with those patients. And all of these patients would continue to be studied um, for quite a while, as well as phase four, where you know patients who have gotten the vaccine are going to be examined. Um, and so this has been going on with the previous mRNA vaccines and many of the vaccines we have. Um, so don't think that December 10th is the end of the study for these patients. I was looking at the data today, 
30,000 people in the Moderna study, but only mm -hmm. 196 infections. So that is going right. to go up, you would think, over the next few months. And, you would expect. Um, yeah. And only 30 patients had severe disease. And I was sort of focused in on that because that's what I really care about, severe disease. And 30, zero out of 30 is not zero. I'm well, no, it's, it's, it's zero out of 15,000 versus 30 out of 15,000. Right. Yeah. And I was talking to a statistician about which is the best way to think about that. And he was trying to tell me that you should be looking at out of the 15, not out of the 30. And I was looking at like a case right. control study. Yep, exactly. 30 versus zero is like, that's not quite fair. Yeah. That un undervalues the efficacy of this vaccine. So Exactly. So yeah, I usually think of it as they had 11 with disease out of 15,000 versus 185 um, or zero with severe disease versus 30. The other thing that is actually quite important to realize is that the outcomes um, that they have been looking at in these trials have been uh, symptomatic infection. Um, they have not been doing nasal swabs throughout uh, this post-vaccine period to look to see if people have been infected. Um, they're taking a lot of blood samples. Um, and so there are things that they can take a look at later on, um, say responses to viral proteins other than spike. Um, that can tell them about infection. But right now, all of the data we're seeing are um, perfect, preventing symptoms, not preventing infection. And so that may have some implications for what we see um, in terms of transmission at the population level. Right. Very important point. We don't know whether you can still get a mild syndrome and pass it on to a grandma and grandpa that hasn't had it. Exactly. Uh, and until we know that, you know, we may still be wearing our masks for a bit. Masks. And we also have no data on these as to how long the immune response is gonna last. Is it gonna last for a week, a month, a year? We think three to six months from natural infection. So hopefully this will be significantly longer, but we don't know, right? Right, that's exactly right. Um, we don't know. We think that these are going to be very useful for us in kind of the pandemic in the short term. Um, I can't say that you won't need to get vaccinated multiple times, um, you know, every couple of years in order to keep your immunity up. That's something that we're going to have to see as time goes on. As long as it's every year or so, that's okay. It's, if it's every three months, that's going to be a pain. Uh, I, I doubt that it would be every three months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for natural infection, there are a few case reports of proven reinfection, but they are the, uh, was the, the exception that proves the rule that it, millions yeah. of people have been infected. And they can only find like three people in the entire world. So right, exactly. it's not a big deal. Exactly. Right. Fantastic. Uh, you're a natural at this too, which is wonderful. Oh, well, um, thank you. The docs are going to love this. <laughs> fantastic stuff. Well, I'm happy to help out. I, I, I'm excited to tell people uh, the great immunology that's out there and the immunology isn't, you know, a big scary thing.